They're going, they're going to be doing so much spending, apparently. Now, we don't, you know, Congress hasn't weighed in on this yet. Congress could uh, save us. I don't know. But um, clearly the administration has the intention of spending astounding amounts of money. And the only way they're going to be able to get it is by printing a lot of it. And um, that will be injected into the economy. That will cause booms wherever it is injected. Welcome to the Power and Market Report. I'm Albert Liu. I'm joined once again by Richard Maybury. He's the publisher of US and World Early Warning Report. He's also the author of the Uncle Eric series of educational books and more recently the founder of ethicssolutions.net. This is the program designed uh, for teaching practical knowledge of right and wrong for the purpose of prospering in your personal and professional life. Richard, thank you very much for coming on the program once again. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, and uh, thank you for having me on, Albert. I always enjoy these interviews. You uh, have a talent for asking the the questions that nobody else asks, and it's really refreshing to be able to uh, sit and talk with you about the, the things that nobody else will touch. It's, it's always great having you on. You are a favorite of the audience. So let's get right down to it. Uh, Donald Trump is now the president, and uh, he has not wasted any time at all uh, reading reports and seeing. He's all over the news, essentially. Even if you follow business news like me, you just can't escape it. Uh, in the first week, I've read something like 15 executive actions already made a lot of noise with this ban on travel uh, from seven countries. So uh, first, uh, your thoughts on the new president and the way he's going about business right now. Um, I, I had the, well, you know, I've, I've often made the comment that political power corrupts the morals and the judgment, and, and that the, the American president has so much power. I mean, he's effectively the emperor of the world. And there's just no human being that can handle that much power and, and remain rational. And I, I think that, you know, I had the feeling a year ago that when Trump began to realize that he really could get the presidency, that he was starting to get giddy with power. And he was starting to get kind of flaky. Um, and I think the closer he got to the White House, the more giddy he got, and now he's there. And, and I think he's just kind of going to wind up being a textbook example of the fact that the presidency is something that just totally corrupts a person's morals and judgment. And um, we're, we're back to the, the political dynamics of ancient Rome. I mean, I keep the name that keeps popping into my head is Caligula. Um, a guy who just went nuts with power. And, and I think that does, the, the presidency does that to anybody who's in there now because it involves so much power that the president is emperor of the world and nobody can handle it. Okay, now specifically, let's talk about the travel ban. It, do, it only affects seven countries, if you ask the administration, they'll tell you it's not a big deal. Uh, do you think that this is going to make uh, the American public safer? And what do you think about the uh, noteworthy absence of Saudi Arabia on that list? You know, that's, I am glad you pointed that out, the absence of Saudi Arabia. Um, there's this kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I would call it deranged um, alliance between Washington and the Saudi royal family that is over the years it's kind of almost taken the place of the so-called special relationship between Washington and London. Um, the Brits are, have been kind of edged out <laughs> by the Saudis as being the number one overseas concern of Washington. And that shows you how clever the Saudi royal family is. Um, and I think, uh, um, you know, that alone is, is something that ought to raise eyebrows, but it doesn't. Uh, Americans have just been eased into this political, geopolitical situation without really realizing that, that it's happened. Now, as far as the, the travel, uh, the travel bans, um, I, it, it, you know, will it make Americans safer? Well, that, it's hard to believe for me. 
because the Washington's enemies um, have had decades and decades to learn how to hurt Washington. And so um, they, these so-called terrorist incidents are really um, <clears throat> the result of, of a tremendous amount of brain power that's gone into ways to get around the U.S. military, the, the U.S. military's ability to protect the country and, and to just basically do an end around of all of that. And, and to think that these sorts of security precautions in the airports and all are going to uh, sidestep what these people have been able to develop is, is ridiculous. And it, it kind of assumes that, that uh, we're up against a bunch of stupid people, and, uh, and that's not the case. So, uh, I mean, among other things, if you want to get into the United States, all you have to do is get on a large fishing boat and cross the ocean and land any place along the many, many thousands of miles of divert, deserted coast that we have and walk in. Um, you know, anybody can invade the United States just by that simple measure alone. Uh, so th anybody who has any sorts of resources over in that part of the world uh, who wants to get into the United States and hurt us is probably already here. Okay, uh, let's move to the domestic policy. Uh, I also noticed this morning that the president was meeting with small business leaders in a well-publicized kind of photo opportunity. And in general, the market for you know the last month uh, or more uh, since he was elected has been celebrating, where the Dow is backing off the 20,000 mark now, but it was going like gangbusters for a while. And it seemed like the only thing they had to celebrate was the fact that Donald Trump is not Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump is not Barack Obama. Is that enough to justify the huge rally we've seen in stocks and optimism? Um, in a way, um, the uh, you know you and I have talked before on on the program about um, the importance of what's called velocity, the speed at which money changes hands. Um, <clears throat> if you have an increase in the speed at which money changes hands then what happens is that that has the same effect on prices as a, a vast increase in the money supply. And if you have a decrease, that has the same effect as a, as a decrease in the money supply. Um, we've been living with so much fear for at least 10 years now that um, the, the velocity of the money has been falling, which is, has the same effect as if people are just taking the money and stuffing it in their mattresses and not spending it. And um, that has offset the amount of the trillions of dollars that the federal government has pumped into the economy to try to inflate it into another boom. Well, what's happening here is, is a, uh, a certain amount of optimism has been injected into the economy by the promises of Donald Trump and there are a lot more people that are optimistic than used to be, let's say, just six months ago. So that has an effect on velocity. That, that makes people confident about taking the money out of their mattresses and going out and spending it. And so I think that Trump's election uh, actually has had a sort of a real effect on the economy and making things better just by creating the confidence that um, will uh, and, I and is making people willing to invest and to buy consumer products and, and you make other uses of the money, uh, go into real estate and such. So it, there is actually a real effect caused by this optimism. But the question is, is the optimism justified? And, and I think that's what's happening in the markets right now is people are asking themselves, is this really for real? Are we really going to have um, a return to free markets and lower taxes and all that? Or is this guy just uh, pulling ideas out of thin air and throwing them out there without any, any serious consideration? And the, the, I think the, the mood at the moment is uh, 
Well, some things he's doing right, but boy, some of them look really ominous too. And uh, and that's where we are right now. We're kind of on on this on the fence. We're either going to drop over into a, a sudden um, wave of of, uh, of despair and desperation when people find out that uh, he's not for real, or um, the the increase in velocity will gain momentum and will simply overcome the mistakes that he's making. I don't know. There's no way to know this. Um, I'm just painting a picture of what I think is going on. Um, it's it's basically about velocity and um, about wi- people's willingness to go out and spend and invest and how much confidence um, he's going to destroy with his mistakes. Right. And, you know, with him, it always seems to be a double-edged sword. So you say, um, for instance, anyone can be a critic. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to stand on the sidelines or uh, while you're running for office, criticize the previous administration. Let's take Obamacare as an example. Uh, repealing it sounds great. Uh, why, is so, why is he so eager to replace it? And what is he going to replace it with? And is it just going to be pretty much the same thing with Trump's name on it instead? Well, he, as I said, uh, uh, the, the psychology is so similar to that of the Roman emperors, it's amazing. Um, he has no um, ideology. And there's a lot of people that think that's a good idea. But if a guy has no ideology, then um, how does he determine the difference between right and wrong? How does he decide which way to go? Um, he's left in the same position that Mussolini was back in uh, the 1920s. Uh, Mussolini had been a uh, leader of the socialist movement in Europe and um, found out that uh, socialism was a big con. And so he was here he is in charge of Italy, and he doesn't have any system that tells him what to do. And so he starts just making it up out of thin air. And his, his, um, his procedure was to simply do whatever appears necessary at the moment. And that's where Trump is right now. He has no ideology, no way of sorting out right from wrong. And so he's just pulling ideas out of thin air, just like Mussolini did. And, and I w- I've been telling my friends you know, for, for months, this guy will make the trains run on time. He will be like Mussolini. Mussolini had that reputation. He promised he'd make the trains run on time, and he did. And so people began to trust Mussolini, and then Mussolini turned into, you know, a, a kind of a small copy of Hitler um, <clears throat> by doing whatever he thought necessary. And and I think that that's the situation with Trump here. The world is going to slowly wake up to the fact that guy has no system for deciding what's right and wrong. He just comes up with ideas out of thin air and throws them out there. He does 140-character tweets, and he moves markets and, and very possibly is going to start wars. And uh, he'll do it all with the best of intentions. I have no doubt about that. But he just doesn't know what he's doing. Not that I'm saying that the Hillary Clinton would have known. Um, I'm just saying that uh, he's just a new brand of emperor uh, which means a person who has power that he simply cannot handle. Uh, you know, Trump is very interesting because in the, in the market, he's known for branding things, right? He's a licensing expert. He brands mm-hmm. hotels with his name. That's why I brought up the example of Obamacare just being rebranded, licensed under the Trump name, because a lot of the things he's advocating sound pretty much the same uh, in terms of children staying on their parents' plan and... Um, uh, pre-existing conditions, the way those will be treated. Uh, but the other thing is um, when a businessman, if you just take, take an average businessman who has no, uh, say, moral philosophy uh, apart from, say, staying out of trouble and conforming to the law, uh, mm-hmm. his guides are going to be profits uh, and staying out of trouble, say, obeying the law. Uh, mm-hmm. But the question is, profits for whom? In the case of a business, it's pretty obvious, right? You have the business, you have the shareholders, you have the customers. Uh, but in the Trump case, you are the law to, to some extent. So that's not, mm-hmm. not, no longer really a prohibiting uh, guideline. And then the profits, who are those going to accrue to? There's no way everyone can benefit. Government, by definition, is pretty much zero sum. 
Uh, so it's going to be the insiders and cronies, perhaps just like it always has been. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, very possibly. Although th there's a new factor here that America's never run into before, um, which is, I get back to the fact that he has no apparent ideology. Um, he's, he's strictly a do-whatever-appears-necessary-at-the-moment kind of guy. Um, and he's doing that because I don't think he knows anything about political power. He doesn't know what it is or what it does. Um, and um, and he has good intentions, which is <laughs> probably more dangerous than anything else. Um, and I, I just have this feeling that um, he has a... Um, desire to experiment with us um, that we are now guinea pigs now this isn't to say that the political left is any different in that respect but they do have a model that they follow the socialist model that they follow which is um, government is a solution to all problems no matter what the problem is the answer is more government um, now he is he is not of that mind, <laughs> but we don't know what mind he is of, <laughs> and and I don't think he does either. I don't think he's ever done any studying on on what really goes on. Um, among other things, uh, he should have you know it's must reading. I think for anybody to understand politics is to to read uh, the Federalist Papers by uh, Hamilton, Madison, and. Uh, and Jay, John Jay, and um, you know they really did a great job of analyzing what the problems are in a government, and you know, and I can tell he, I don't think he's read it, or if he's read it, he didn't remember it or understand it. But it, it's those sorts of things. This guy does not know what his job is, and he's just experimenting, and and uh, he's whimsical. That it, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. There's just. Um, I don't think there's any way to predict what he's going to do. There's just no way. That's a little alarming. Uh, I want to circle back. You were talking about uh, velocity of money, uh, just central bank considerations in general. We haven't seen the type of inflation that many of us have been concerned about, uh, but I'm wondering if this might be the time. Now that Trump yeah. is here, they're going to ramp up domestic spending. Got some numbers this morning. It seems that wages are up 0.4% uh, in December. Uh, PCE was up 1.6 on the year, still below the target. But uh, I'm wondering if the, if the government is encouraged by this and they think that they can continue on and uh, perhaps engage in some fiscal stimulus as well as monetary stimulus, uh, do you think we're gonna see prices that most people worry about, meaning prices for food, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're going to see that move up in a big way in the next two years? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I would give it a 90% probability. Um, and, uh, and for all the reasons we've just been discussing, if they're, going to, they're going to be doing so much spending, apparently. Now, we don't, you know, Congress hasn't weighed in on this yet. Congress could uh, save us. I don't know. But, um, Clearly, the administration has the intention of spending astounding amounts of money, and the only way they're going to be able to get it is by printing a lot of it, and um, that will be injected into the economy. That will cause booms wherever it is injected, and that will create more optimism, and the thing could feed on itself. And I, I really, you know, velocity occurs in three basic stages. We've been in stage one, which is a sort of a deflationary condition for like uh, eight to ten years. And I can really see this leading to stage two within a year, um, two years at the outside, with just this increase in optimism caused by all this money being dumped in and, and by the confidence that some people feel that they're willing to go out and spend. Um, so, yeah, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, to me, uh, the precious metals, which are always havens in the face of a, uh, a se severe inflation. I think they are big bargains right now. And uh, anybody who gets into the metals today 
will, let's say, three years from now, be really patting himself on the back at how smart he was. Richard, I want to run this quote by you because I'm not sure if you want to stand behind what you just said. I could excerpt it and say, Richard Mayberry says, Congress may save us. That's not something I usually hear from Richard Mayberry. <laughs> Out of context, <laughs> it doesn't sound like you at all. <laughs> of course, I understood exactly what you were saying. Uh, yeah, maybe I should retract that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ruin my reputation yeah. here. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's possible. You know, you get lucky sometimes. <laughs> so maybe they will. Right. And to your point about uh, uh, the different stages of inflation, uh, I think I know what stage three is. Hopefully we don't get to that. But the thing that tips me off about us possibly moving to what you're categorizing as stage two is uh, before the inflation, uh, the beginning of the cycle, it comes from credit expansion. And, uh, you know, lower interest rates and whatnot, that always goes into higher order production. So you see assets rise. But eventually that stuff trickles down and then uh, the way they're talking in the administration about, about more jobs and tariffs and, and keeping the spending at home, uh, that to me is something I call Joe Sixpack inflation. So that is inflation that's just going to turn around right away into consumer goods and it's going to raise the prices of everything that people like to uh, consume every day. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, um, and I think that that's probably... Um on the mines. It's, it's actually built into the plan, uh, assuming they have any kind of plan. Um, they're, they're intending for Joe Sixpack to feel better about things and to go out and spend money. And then that new demand will make businesses more confident about expanding and hiring people. Uh, so it has a, a feedback effect that's, that uh, could, uh, could definitely occur, and I think they're planning on it occurring that, but that's today. Who knows what they're going to decide tomorrow? Uh, these people change their minds, or at least he does, every every few days. So, um, I mean, it's just it's such an insane situation. I cannot believe it that um, we've got people here uh, running the most powerful government ever seen on Earth, and they've got this collection of ideas, many of which have long ago been proven to be insane. I mean, really insane. The, the trade restrictions, his, he, his intent to escalate the trade war is just horrible. There's, even the craziest economist in the world would tell you that that's a horrible thing to do. Um, the, the demonstration of it was in the Great Depression. It was the smooth hawley tariffs, trade restrictions, that um, took a garden variety recession and turned it into the Great Depression because people around the world stopped trading with each other and all of these businesses all over the world went broke it was a horrible thing and it led to in the 1960s the what's called the Kennedy round um, of trade talks uh, after after the Great Depression had happened and that had morphed into World War II um, you know there's uh, Frederick Bastiat's old saying that uh, when goods do not cross borders, soldiers will. And that is exactly what happened. Bastiat said that like in the 1850s, and boy, the Great Depression really proved it. So the world came through the Great Depression and then the World War II, and in the 60s, these governments were still so scared of what trade restrictions would do that they launched the Kennedy Round, and the Kennedy round was um, about it, um, the governments involved represented about 80% of world trade. And they just slashed trade restrictions like crazy in order to backpedal away from the mess that Smoot Hawley had created in the 30s. And they weren't doing it because, uh, I'm sure, because uh, they, they uh, loved the common people and wanted things to get better. They were scared to death that if the trade restrictions stood, we'd go back into another world war. And um, I don't think the Trump gang understands any of that. I think they have no understanding of history at all, especially not economic history. And again, this is not an endorsement for Hillary Clinton or the political left. They're just as stupid about it. But um, to go into that office and not understand Smoot-Hawley and the Kennedy round 
is a very dangerous thing, and I don't think they do understand it. I totally agree, uh, Richard. With the time I have left, I just want to hit a few points, get your ideas. Uh, you like to put geopolitics together with economics and investing. I don't know anyone who does it better. So let's just uh, think about what this could mean for some of the investments we like to follow. Uh, for instance, the, the travel restrictions immediately affected certain airlines uh, because people from those banned countries, uh, there are no direct flights to the U.S. Uh, from those countries. They all go through Western Europe or Arab nations. And we noticed right away that Emirates uh, was hit, as was Lufthansa. Uh, what do you think about, we'll start with the airlines and then we'll go to uh, the producers. But what, what do you think about just uh, off the cuff airlines? How are they going to fare? with these new restrictions? Well, um, I, I'm not too worried about airlines. Um, they uh, are pretty adaptable. They can change their routes and such. Um, and, um, you know, they, they would just, um, if, there's, if it does cause a big d drop in demand, I think that um, they would probably adapt. I can't imagine it causing enough of a drop that it would really hurt them very badly. Um, the, those seven countries that are banned um, don't really account for that much of the airline traffic, I don't think. Uh, so um, it, it's just simply a case where these people who um, are from those countries and are in the United States working in American companies had better not go back home because they might not get back into the U.S. Um, now, other other industries, it, it's hard to say. Um, you don't know what he's going to do next. That's the whole thing. We, you just don't know what he's going to do. So it's really hard to predict. Uh, the, the one prediction that I'm confident making is that um, <clears throat> this is a really good time to buy defense stocks. Uh, they're down a bit because he's been bad-mouthing them. Um, but the plans that he has um, geopolitically are almost certain to lead to more U.S. involvement in wars elsewhere. And, and I think the South China Sea and the East China Sea are the places. Um, the Chinese government needs a diversion. They've got an economic crisis building there that is horrible. And they've got to divert their population's attention away from that. And the way, you know, rulers have always done that is by stirring up wars, because the people realize that once they're in a war, their government is their only defense against the enemy. So um, I think that the Chinese government is deliberately stirring up a military crisis in the East China Sea and South China Sea, and I think that the Trump administration is walking right into it blindfolded. And that's going to cause a tremendous new demand for uh, military stuff. So to me, um, the Trump gang's uh, bravado, um, military bravado, is going to lead to, uh, almost inevitably, to a big defense buildup. Okay, let's talk about uh, other businesses. Uh, right away uh, with uh, the travel ban, we also saw a sell-off in a lot of tech companies uh, because people are anticipating maybe that there'll be a change of policy with the H-1B visas that allow a lot of talented and educated people from overseas to come here. Uh, mm -hmm. Having come from the tech industry myself, Richard, I can tell you that H-1Bs are, are oxygen for a lot of these companies. I mean, they just simply mm. cannot do without a, f uh, a source of skilled and educated labor. Uh, Trump seemed to have been getting along really well with these high-tech leaders, but they're not gonna be happy about this. So how do you think the political struggle is going to go? Because certainly, I would expect that the biggest players in technology are gonna be opposed to, to uh, any change in this. Uh, who do you think is gonna win out? Boy, that's a great question. Um, How much pull um, do these people have as a group? Um, they didn't support well, him they, politically, except for a couple people. Um, yeah. How much influence do they even have right now? 
it depends on how aggressive they want to be. Um, they can, they've got a lot of money, and um, they can bribe, you know, however many politicians they need to uh, to get done what they want done. It's just a di- kind of a question of how far do they want to go. Um, let's see, how can I illustrate this? I, uh, I used to know a man who uh, flew back and forth um, just coincidentally flew back and forth uh, between Washington, D.C. and New York City um, every weekend. And that happens to be, uh, some. there's some collection of flights that happen to be the ones that the high-priced call girls ride going from New York to Washington, D.C. for the big parties that happen in Washington, D.C. over the weekends. And um, <clears throat> he would he would actually be, you know, you can pretty much spot the real super professional call girls when you're sitting on an, on an airliner. And, um, and he would watch the same group of women <laughs> week after week flying back and forth from their New York penthouses to the, um, the big parties in Washington, D.C. Now, these tech companies are just as capable of hiring those women as anybody else is and to supply whatever other uh, demand there might be in Congress. Uh, And so, uh, yeah, they can probably bribe their way into whatever it is they want by uh, essentially buying congressmen that way. But I I don't know what they will do. Um, You know, how how low do they want to be able to, how how low do they want to stoop in order to protect their companies? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> That's a very good question, Richard. Um, before we close, then, uh, things that you like, things that you don't like, clearly you're uh, optimistic on defense. Uh, you have been on the past, and it's worked out quite well. Uh, what do you think people should stay away from? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, I... I I, I would say, I, I don't know, the only thing I'm confident saying is stay away from any sorts of long-term plans. Have a, have a very short-term view, uh, be a broken field runner with your finances. Just try to accept the fact you cannot make long-term plans anymore because the government has too much power. They can upset your apple cart anytime they feel like it, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to concentrate on being adaptable rather than in picking something that you think is a long-term uh, sure thing or a, a long-term uh, promising uh, enterprise because you can't do that because the government um, makes everything short-term there, there's just no way to have a long-term plan don't let yeah I guess maybe one of the most important things is don't let anybody talk you into a long-term plan don't think you have some sort of grip on the future. You don't, because they have too much power. And uh, adaptability is something that you need to to foster, to get good at. Um, there's an old uh, old saying in the military that uh, uh, no battle plan uh, survives the first shot. And we're in that position economically now because the government um, has so much power. So, so you've got to work with an advisor who understands these geopolitical and economic things very, very well and has the attitude that he's ready at any moment to uh, bounce from one opportunity to the next according to whatever the political uh, power junkies decide to do. That's great advice, Richard. Um, Richard is the uh, publisher of U.S. and World Early Warning Report. You can check that out at earlywarningreport.com. What's on your mind these days, Richard? What are you writing about uh, there at the newsletter? Um, The trade, you know, the the, uh, February issue of Early Warning Report just went out, and it has a lot in there. I think it's one of the best I ever ever wrote. It has a lot in there about the the likely effect of uh, the trade restrictions 
and other factors around Trump, what we're just talking about here today. Um, and um, I, I think it's a must for everybody. And the, the January issue, too, um, if, uh, if someone subscribes, they really ought to get the January issue, too, because it talks about the importance of the fact that Trump has no ideology um, and uh, explains that very well. We were talking about Mussolini. Um, there's a lot in there about what the way Trump is following Mussolini. Not, not deliberately. I don't think he has any deliberate intentions of doing that. He's just going down the same road that Mussolini did because he's making the same mistakes. Um, and, that, and that's the basic thing for right now. It, it's, a, it's a case where month to month you've got to reassess everything because you don't know what those people are going to do. I think you're absolutely right, Richard. And I think uh, nowadays everyone needs a Twitter account, maybe even you. <laughs> Can we expect to see you on Twitter anytime soon? Unlikely. Um, I uh, that's an, I think that's another whole show. <laughs> but um, I I really think that uh, the economic model, I'm sorry, the electronic model that the world economy is following is an unviable one. If if you go back to 1985 when personal computers were just coming on the scene, everybody was all excited about it. And you had said to somebody, you know, these things are great. The day is not far away when everybody's going to have his own computer in his own home, and every computer will be hooked to every other computer. So every crook and thief and murderer and sex pervert in the world is going to be able to get into your computer. Isn't that a great idea? <laughs> yeah. And that's what we've got today. Your computer is hooked to, um, through the Internet, to every despicable person in the world who wants to hurt people. And, and I don't know what's going to come of this, but, my God, uh, if you talk to the people in the banking industry, I mean, all they can talk about is cybersecurity, that uh, they're just under attack constantly. So this is an unviable model. It cannot last. And, uh, you know, I, I think what's coming is some sort of uh, a vetting process where you're not going to be allowed to hook into the Internet unless you're bonded. Or you won't be able to hook into certain parts of the Internet unless you're bonded. But there's going to be some system for making sure, or, or doing our best to make sure that the criminals can't get into your computer in your house. And um, I think, uh, I, you know, how, where that's going to go, I don't know. I just know what's not working, and markets are going to find a solution, but I don't know what it will be. You know, and so I, I, I'm more and more I'm backing away from the electronic world. I think it, there's going to be some sort of a horrific crash, and I don't want to be too dependent on my computer because of that. Very interesting. Maybe that's another a topic for another day. Richard, I think we could talk for a very long time about that. Uh, on that note, we'll leave it. Thank you very much once again for coming back. I hope we can do it again soon. The website is uh, earlywarningreport.com. Please check that out. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Albert. It's always a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Thank you. And uh, please don't forget to visit me at my new home on sproutmedia.com and our YouTube channel, which you can access uh, by clicking the box uh, on the left-hand side. Follow me on Twitter at Albert K. Liu. And until next time, take care. Hi, I'm Albert Liu, host of the Power and Market Report. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe to my channel by clicking the button on the top left uh, of the screen. And don't forget, you can also visit us on Facebook and at powerandmarket.com. Thanks again for watching.